All right. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining today. I'm Christina with The Muse, and we're so excited that you can join us as we partner with Smashfly to bring you two awesome speakers who will dive into the six essential content types for your candidate experience. Before we get started, I just wanted to run through a couple things. Today's session will be recorded, and a link to the recording and slides will be sent to you today. And we love questions, so feel free to submit them in the control panel throughout the webinar. We'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, so the next thing I just want to share is that we will be on Twitter. So if you can use the hashtag candid content and follow and engage with Smashfly and use employers uh, to continue talking about the content we're discussing today. Now I'll pass it on to our speaker, Robert, to introduce himself. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, folks, and let me add my thanks for you being here today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be speaking today on this topic. Uh, my name is Robert Matson. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Smashfly. And I have been in the, uh, the talent management and recruiting space for uh, probably over a dozen years at this point. And uh, I'm very excited where my background in marketing and my background in uh, HR-related technology comes together on this topic. And I get to share a little bit about what I found to be effective when it comes to, uh, when it comes to marketing and recruitment marketing. And I'm thrilled to be here with Tony. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I'm, I'm so excited to be here as well. Uh, so, hi, everyone. I lead the people team at The Muse. And you know, my career journey started in the ad agency world, where I did brand strategy, account management, and research type of work. Uh, I then found my calling in HR, uh, joining McCann Erickson, a uh, large uh, global ad agency, where I was for six years, initially focused on diversity and inclusion work. Uh, including recruiting multicultural talent, uh, doing community partnerships, leading cultural awareness training, et cetera, and that expanded into a much broader HR role over time. Uh, and then I moved to Condé Nast, where I focused on a wide range of HR and talent responsibilities across a wide range of skill sets, from editors to engineers to paper buyers. Um, for any of you out there who uh, view paper buyers, it's a very interesting job. Um, and now I get to lead the recruiting, HR, and L&D function at The Muse. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with The Muse, we're a career platform that gives millions of users career while also helping companies showcase their company cultures via technology, video, and other uh, content. Uh, about me personally, I live in Astoria with my husband and son, and they are my daily sunshine. And I'm um, super happy to be here and excited to, to do this webinar with Rob. Thanks a lot, Tony. And uh, I didn't mention my son, so I figure if you can mention your family, I can do I can do mine too. I've got a wonderful red-haired 11-year-old boy named Sam. So with that being said, let's jump right into today's topic. And I'd like to start with talking a little bit about stories. Any time that you want to communicate on any topic, the key is to be memorable and to make a connection with the people that are listening. And when I was doing a little research for this talk today, I, uh, I drove into my office, which is in Concord, Massachusetts, and I, and I walked to my office. My office is actually on the first floor of an old mill building, and like a lot of the New England old mill buildings, it has a lot of character. So I was sitting down in a, in a fairly small room that has uh, brick walls, a little cutout with granite in it that probably was used in a fire uh, to uh, set a fire in 19, you know, probably in the early 1900s. In fact, oddly enough, uh, my grandmother, Kitty Lawler, worked as a seamstress in that building in 1905. So it has a lot of history for me. So I was sitting in my office and I was doing some research and I read a really interesting article uh, in the Harvard Business Review. And it was about oxytocin. Now for those of you not familiar with oxytocin, oxy oxytocin is a chemical compound that our bodies secrete when we start feeling trust or someone shows us kindness. So it really is the beginning of empathy. And so in the study, they talked about how they figured out how they could kind of hack and, cre and create an environment where the body would create oxytocin um, in, a, in a kind of a regular way. And they found out that what happened when people watched movies, when they viewed stories, they would actually, uh, their body would secrete oxytocin. And you would start to relate with the characters in the movie. And the example they used, which I thought was great, was after you watch a James Bond film, you feel like you can take on the world. Or if you watched uh, the uh, Spartans, uh, Spartans in 300, you wanted to go work out afterwards. 
Um, so it's just a great example of how the mind works and how it starts to connect people when you watch stories. And there's another interesting proof point, and this is actually from the London Business Journal, uh, that if you give someone a stat, they'll remember it about 5 to 10% of the time. If you partner that stat with a picture, it goes up to about 25%. But when you tell a story, it goes up to almost 70%. People will recollect what you're talking about. So when you think about stories, it's really about creating something that people will remember, creating a connection between you and your listener, and in truth, building a relationship between them and you. So it is really a fantastic way of getting your message and your content across in a very memorable way. But there is a little bit of science. And if we take a look at the next slide, this is kind of the hierarchy of needs. So everyone's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, this is kind of something I put together as a hierarchy of content creation. Because in my opinion, many people do it the wrong way. We get caught up so often in the things we want to say. So if we're writing a job rec, we want to make sure that we've got, you know, we won't have the specs of the job. So we want to make sure that we understand it reports to this manager or it needs this kind of background or a degree in this particular uh, area. And we get caught up in that. But when we think about it, what does the person want to read or want to consume first when it comes to content? So instead of starting with what we want to say, let's start with what they want to consume. So when you think about it, the first job of content is to be consumed. People have to want to consume that content, to read it or to view it. So I'll give you an example, Game of Thrones. I think I'm the one human being in the New England area that doesn't watch Game of Thrones. Everyone else loves to consume that content. So if you can make something as interesting as Game of Thrones, people will obviously want to consume it. Then the next step in is, well, does the audience get something out of it? So what if on Game of Thrones, um, let's say you were watching something and they were showing how to pot a plant in Game of Thrones as one of the characters talks to another. And you happen to be interested in gardening. And they showed an interesting way of potting a plant, just like a how-to video on YouTube. So the first step is you want to watch it. The second step is you get something out of it. Now, what if, let's take it out of the Game of Thrones because it's a little hard to carry that metaphor all the way through, but let's talk about that second level, some kind of YouTube video on learning something. Well, what if it was a product that you were watching? So if you were potting a plant, maybe it's a particular type of potting soil. So that enables the person that is creating that content to get something out of it. It's learning about a particular item, or in this case, we are going to be looking at um, maybe it's something in the recruiting space where you're learning about a particular job. And finally, you get down to the facts and figures. That's when you get to the details. So first, someone has to want to watch it. Then they need to get something out of it. Then you need to get something out of it. And then they can learn the facts and the figures. So that is kind of the hierarchy of needs. And if you think outside in, you have a better shot of getting your content consumed and getting your message across. And that really sums up, if you look at the next slide, what is the mission? The mission is to go from the individual to you, to make sure that there is a pathway. Now, this pathway isn't necessarily all in one particular type of content. It can be through multiple steps. So you can actually create what we think of in marketing as nurture paths. How do I nurture someone from the beginning of our interaction to the place I want them to go? So that is something, as we go through all of our content types today, think about how you can utilize them to carry your story from something someone wants to consume all the way back to you. And it might be mixing and matching. You might have certain pieces of content, whether it's a blog or a video or, or a, a job rec. You figure out the path that you will take to bring them to where you want them to go. Yeah, Rob, I, I love what you're saying about building connections and building relationships uh, and bringing, bringing people along in the journey. Um, and I, you know, I think if we're skipping along to the next slide, um, I, I noticed that if you think about personas, I think recruiters are being asked to think like marketers more and more. And so we're hearing this term persona 
over and over again. And obviously, as recruiters, we're always thinking about uh, how we can tailor our messages to candidates uh, and nurture them along the way. But is there something else we should be doing? Uh, is there something else we should be keeping in mind? Any tips from a marketer perspective? Absolutely, uh, and it's, Tony and I, were, you and I had a discussion the other day about people talk about personas and they often go, well, we know who we're pitching to. We know who we're trying to connect with. But in marketing, we actually create almost a baseball card of a persona. We'll have a picture, we'll have a name, we'll have an age, we'll have a background, we'll have whether they have family or not, what region they live in, where are they in their career. Because the thing is, when you think about messages, anytime you want to get a message through to someone, it's very specific to what their interests are, not only as an individual, but also where they are at that moment in their life. So if, uh, if I'm trying to get, to get someone to come to my organization and I say, well, you listen, I'm pitching someone who's a more senior person and I want to make sure that they're aware that we've got a great 401k program or we've got uh, some kind of matching program for, um, for education. Because that could be very important to someone of that, at that point of their life because that's usually the seniority level that we need and usually they are interested in that type of topic. It changes my story. And it's important for people to, to go down to that level of detail because the minute you start writing it down and documenting it, it starts bringing up different angles that you can use to tell your story in a different way and to uh, really elevate certain sections of it that are going to be vitally important to the person that is consuming that content. I love that idea of creating a baseball card for candidate attraction. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to try that. But what about, uh, what about ownership? So I do hear also from my recruiting colleagues that they don't have access to some of the social channels or career sites or whatever the channel may be to really promote our employer brand, which as we all know really helps us attract those candidates. Um, what can we do in those situations? Do you have any tips for how we can most effectively partner with marketing departments who most of the time own those channels? Yeah, it's, no, that's really interesting. And as a marketer, um, in the past we didn't have control of our, of, our brand, of our channels either because the technology was such that we had to rely on the IT team to actually make changes that we needed to make. So in marketing, we actually weren't that much different. So from, I think, a technology point of view, you're finding that technology is getting easier and easier to use, so you're seeing it getting in the hands of, of people that don't necessarily have to be phenomenally technical. But if it's just a question of pure ownership, uh, it's an issue where you have to realize that marketers are trying to do a couple things. As a marketer, I am trying to promote the brand of the organization. So not only the products or services that the company sells, but also who we are as a, as a brand. So what makes our people special? What makes our environment or our culture special? So there's definitely an overlap. And the interesting thing, I've worked in the past with, um, with the HR staffs at my past companies, and oftentimes I found them to be phenomenal partners because they want to create content, I want to create content, why don't we work at it together? And oftentimes, I would sit down with Maurice, who was one of my uh, partners in the talent acquisition group at a past company, and we'd sit down and we would brainstorm. And we would come up with the stories that we both wanted to tell. And that way that he could use the things that I would create and vice versa. And also, he had connections to people that I didn't have. So he was actually a resource for me because he could walk and say, hey, listen, I know all these people that have great stories. I just don't have maybe the tools that I need, or maybe I want a little bit more polish than I'm able to give because I'm just not used to you know, telling these stories in different ways. If I supply the raw materials, will you help me refine them into the great stories and then we can both leverage them? So if you go and talk to the marketing people and say, listen, I've got value to bring you, you'll find them very, very open to, uh, to help out and provide the skills that they have. Yeah, I love that advice, building a relationship and working together towards a, a common goal or a common problem, to solve a common problem, I love that. Um, great, so we're going to move along and jump right into the six essential types of content uh, to enhance your candidate experience. And so we've already talked about the importance of storytelling, and that theme is going to continue as we talk about these six types of essential content. And that, we've whittled that down to really blogs, video, employee testimonials, visual content, uh, job descriptions, and email. 
And so we're going to talk about uh, blogs. And, you know, Rob, this is a really interesting one to me because uh, what I also hear from my recruiting colleagues, or sorry, recruiter colleagues, is that they absolutely have heard that uh, blogs are important, uh, good pieces of content, but where do you start? Do the recruiters have to uh, maintain them? And any tips from a marketing perspective on creating a really uh, great blog? Sure, not a problem. And the, my first piece of advice to anyone who's, who's starting blogging is don't fear the blog. A lot of people get intimidated. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to maintain this forever. I'm going to have to write something every day. Um, and what I usually tell people is don't be a writer to start with. Be an editor and put together a framework for what you want to put into your blog, how often you want to update it, and what are the topics that you want to, uh, that you want to cover over the course of a period of time. And you don't have to start with a whole year. Start with just the first three months. Start with a quarter and say, okay, what could I do? And then you can replicate that process over time. So I think the important thing to think about is, okay, if I'm an editor and I have a you know, bunch of topics I want to cover, a story arc, um, let me come up with some ideas. And if you come up with some titles, it's a great way to start because once you're an editor and you've got titles and topics, then you can start going to people and say, hey, would you be interested in writing on this? Whether that is an employee, whether that's your new marketing buddy, because again, remember, they've got content that they need to create and they love to have a title to start with. I guarantee that for you. So, and start spreading the wealth and start saying, oh, who can I do? And it's not only um, the people that you would think of normally, but think about the people in your company that maybe aren't writers, but they can come up with great, you know, great stories and just go and talk to them. So say, hey, tell me a story about what you love about this company or why it makes your life at home easier or where you know, it was a great work-life balance and it gave you a bit of a break so you could do the things you needed to do. And they'll tell you these stories and you'll be so surprised at how quickly that quick story, and oftentimes I record it, I make sure they know I recorded it, and then I'll just keep those as notes, and suddenly a blog just comes right out. So it's a situation where if you start with a framework, you'll be in pretty good shape. And I've got a couple of examples of a couple of things that might help as well. So if we take a look at this, this is an example from Nestle Fiorina. So they do some really interesting stuff um, in this blog that um, a lot of people don't think about. So they're doing tips for job seekers, which I think is important. They're doing a lot of the uh, why is it great to work there. Uh, they're, doing a lot, they're doing an FAQ, which I think is a great way of going about it because you don't have to be phenomenally creative to do a really great FAQ. And it's something that you can do with pretty much anyone on any team as long as you can come up with the good questions and find the really solid answers. And it adds so much value to uh, the person reading it because you know, it's probably the questions that are most likely in top of mind in their area. But if you don't have the time to do this, if we look at the next example from Fiserv, you'll see that they took a path, they said, listen, we'd like to do something that's kind of bloggish, but we're going to just take some content that we have that is already in place and we are going to put it up there that's it's more evergreen. So you don't have to keep this updated all the time. You just update it occasionally when topics change or when you find something that you'd like to replace. So it gives you the, almost the same, um, same power as a blog. Not quite as personal, but it does give you some great content that people can find excellent value in. That's great. Um, I love the idea of starting with something e a little bit easier, like an FAQ. Uh, or having just really structured topics. I think that's really great advice as a starting point. Uh, it doesn't feel as daunting that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. So great. We're going to move right into video, which is our next uh, essential form of content. And I, you know, I really love video. Um, and I think there's so many ways that you can use it for talent attraction. Uh, but there's three that I think are really uh, come to mind. Uh, most readily and that we use at Muse. The first is about sharing company information. Uh, so a video is a really great way to inform your talent about company culture, values, if you have a really interesting origin story uh, that either your CEO or your founders would want to share in video, that's such a great thing to be able to share with talent, particularly when you're in sell, sell mode. Um, the company's purpose and mission, uh, particularly if that's uh, told through employees, 
And sharing information with candidates like this is such a powerful tool. Uh, again, when, when you're in this sort of selling mode and someone really isn't bought into talking to you uh, and needs more information about your company. So company information is one purpose. Another way uh, to really use video in uh, the candidate experience process is for team introductions. Uh, to not only say that you'll be working on a great team, but to actually show them through video and to see that team tell their story and interact uh, on camera is so powerful. So that's another way. Uh, and the third way is uh, what to expect in the interview process. Uh, this is so powerful. Imagine if uh, someone gets in the phone screen, says, and they get an email from you, and it's a video of you or someone in your company saying, thank you so much for applying. Uh, Welcome to the Muse interview process, and this is what you can expect. Uh, they also get an email from you with a really cool infographic of all the steps. Uh, and so video can just be a really uh, dynamic vehicle for sharing additional information that candidates really want uh, as they're in cell mode or as they're just entering into the natural interview flow. Uh, Rob, do you have any other uh, tips or examples you want to share? Uh, absolutely. I am a huge fan of video when it comes to uh, telling great stories because you can do it in a lot of different ways. You can do it in a very formal way or a very informal way. And a lot of people I talk to say, listen, video is hard. It's really hard to get good video. Um, we, don't, we don't have the tools. We don't have the equipment. The great thing is that technology has caught up. So everyone on this phone, I'm betting, has a video editing suite in their back pocket or sitting in front of them. Because an iPhone, an Android phone, the, the quality of video you can do is really, really good with these tools, if you know how. And I'll give you a piece of advice. Just Google good video taken on iPhone. And you will see a bunch of tutorials on how you can take some nice, quick, and dirty videos. Another great thing is a GoPro. And the reason I love these is because it gives you that first-person point of view. Uh, so doing some guerrilla style videos. So I'm going to go through just a really quick list of the types of videos that I find exciting. Um, interview videos where you're talking to someone at your company and getting a candid view of maybe just popping up in front of their desk and asking them how their day is going so you can get a feel for what it's like day to day. Um, first person, basically a video selfie where you can just turn it on yourself and tell the story of what your day is like. Um, kind of a 60 minute style video, which is in a more formal video back and forth. Uh, maybe a demonstration video where you're showing what your company makes or you know, what services you provide that give people a feel for that. And, um, or even if you remember the show West Wing and the famous walking through the halls talking quickly, uh, that is something you can do as well. Uh, one great idea I heard the other day is a, an organization uh, that is in a, a really prime location in a city. And what they want to do is like we want to showcase how uh, accessible we are. So basically, they had an idea, I don't think they've done it, but they had an idea of actually walking through and saying, hey, I'm on the subway. This is how I get to the office. And then cutting immediately to, I'm on a bus. It drops off right in front of my building. And then the car, it's like, hey, and we have free parking. So it was just a great example of showing uh, something that could be really important to someone looking to work at your organization in a really fun way. Yeah, I love that. Um... Great, so we're going to jump right into uh, employee testimonials. Uh, and as you all know, I mean, employee testimonials are really powerful for so many reasons. Mostly, you know, Rob talked about the power of storytelling. It's why uh, companies like Nike have hired professional storytellers. The power of storytelling is real. And telling an interesting story is hard, but telling an interesting and compelling story from a brand authority to candidates that they're going to trust is much harder nowadays. So telling the story through your employees can be a really valuable tool for you. Um, so there's a few things that you want to keep in mind as you're trying to uh, capture employee testimonials. So first is trying to figure out what types of employee stories are really going to help you as you attract candidates, particularly as you're thinking about um, candidate segmentation and what stories are really going to resonate with those groups. Uh, so maybe you're interested in Telling, talking about particular tech, technical problems that employees are solving, or maybe it's about their internal mobility within the company, or a really great boss that they've had that's mentored them, um, or the company mission. Uh, so really deciding what you want them to talk about, and then trying to pick those employees that have those stories, or casting a much wider net as you capture stories. So that's the next phase, which is to actually capture the stories. Now there's a few ways you can do this. You can do it the old school way, 
of just a Google form and send it out and uh, employees submit their stories, uh, those who want to share. But there's other tools at the Muse. We have a tool called Rambler uh, that we used actually to capture our employee stories. And what's cool about this tool is that it also has a social sharing capability. So employees can actually share their stories that they created on their uh, LinkedIn or social platforms immediately, which is really great as recruiters because you have this blast of people who are immediately talking about the company. Um, it also has a, a opt-in brand ambassador function, and I would say regardless, it's really great uh, to get approval from employees as they share their stories with you right away, uh, that you can actually use the stories either in social media or job descriptions, um, wherever you want to use them. We actually use some of our employee stories in employee outreach emails, particularly when we're in cell mode. Um, but they can also be used at recruiting events as sort of background decor, as people are sort of networking to have uh, around posted around the room so people can read some of the employee stories uh, about your company. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is once you capture your uh, employee testimonials, you want to set up some sort of maintenance process so that you're doing it on a regular basis, so you're, you're getting sort of a story refresh. Uh, we are probably going to go through the brand builder tool here uh, like every three to six months so that you're getting new hires um, and you're just always making sure that those stories are fresh and employees have an opportunity to capture some of the new things that have happened to them at the company that you want to share from a recruiting perspective to attract um, talent and, and give your candidates a good experience. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that the power of employee stories as, as I've seen them is that uh, they really help your candidates along the way connect with the heart and soul of your company, the thing that's so hard to describe in writing uh, in just text message, uh, in just text. So uh, that's a few ways I think employee testimonials are, are really powerful. Uh, Rob, I, I think you have an example to share. Uh, yeah, this is actually uh, from Veritas. They, they do a nice job because they bring in some of their employees that have different job types because people want to see people that are like them. So this is a great example of looking at someone who might work in a warehouse. And they come in and they feel you know, how empowered they are to come to work and, and what their day-to-day -day is like. And the nice thing about this is that it doesn't have to be a video, uh, but the vi a video gives it kind of an immediacy to it. But I, I would say when it comes to testimonials, don't be afraid of using different medium and different types of content for your testimonials because people are going to consume it in different ways. So if you have something on uh, your career site, um, or whether you have a video, or whether you even have a, a, an infographic that has three or four testimonials in it that all are around a particular theme, that way you might be able to use that piece of content to send about, hey, why is it great to have flexible hours? Why is it great that you have a flexible vacation policy? Why is it phenomenal that we have locations where different people can work, and they get to hear different people's viewpoints and get a feel for the company and how they work as a whole. Yeah, I love that. Good advice. Uh, so we're heading into our uh, next essential piece of content, and that is uh, visual content. And it seems broad, but we've narrowed it down a little bit for you. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about uh, using visual content. And the first step, I think, in uh, getting started with visual content is to make a best friend in marketing PR design. <laughs> so Rob, you and I are really good friends. Um, but We're good friends. <laughs> but in all seriously, in seriousness, you want to make sure that uh, whatever visuals that you're creating are really in line with the company brand architecture uh, so that you can also leverage the power of the existing work that your marketing team has done to build up that brand uh, for recruiting purposes and to enhance your candidate experience. But let's talk about employee uh, photos. So. It's really important as you're thinking about employee photos uh, to, to also think about uh, some sort of maintenance process so that uh, you can capture uh, really great employee photos on perhaps a regular basis, uh, as there's always just natural turnover in a company. Uh, we actually have our employees when they start sign a photo waiver. Of course, they don't have to sign it, but most of them don't mind. And this actually allows us to take pictures uh, more organically as natural things come up across the company. Uh, that we can use in real time uh, for the candidate experience process. Um, it's also a really great idea to look at your company events calendar uh, three months in advance um, to make sure that you have a professional or employee photographer ahead of time lined up 
and then you can give that photographer some direction as to what types of photos you may want to have come out of the event so that those photos actually really align with what you're trying to do for the can experience and, and the purpose that you're trying to use them for. And Rob, I think you have a few examples as well around uh, visual content. Or do you want to uh, touch on social graphics and infographics? Because I think- uh, Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, about those topics just uh, before we jump into the examples. Um, just to give a little bit of a little bit of marketing theory behind it. Um, so when it comes to visuals, there are so many different options that you can use. Um, if anyone remembers the old New Yorker comics, uh, they were actually the first meme. They were just pen and ink drawings with a you know some kind of amusing comment. Um, so you can do something that's very very simple. I mean, you could use something as use something in Canva. I mean, I, I, a lot of our marketing team actually creates some of their own graphics because they're trying to do something that is um, it's fairly simple, but they can use some of the powerful tools that we have today. Um, but I think the one thing to remember is that you're still trying to tell a story. And even if it is just a, you know, a one-shot a one story, it's still a story. You're trying to get through a, a concept that you are trying to pass along. And you can also work these together. So you can take a bunch of different um, short visuals and create a story, whether that could be in an infographic. You can even do something like a comic book. Um, there's some great marketing examples of things like Gatorade did where they were trying to pitch to high school kids so they actually created a comic book to talk about how Gatorade affects the body. It was a, actually a really interesting marketing campaign called Freaks. So it's a situation where you can use these visuals um, with very few words to still get your message across of what it's like to work in your organization. So it's something that um, I think it's important for people to start thinking about. And I have a couple of examples here. We have one right here. This is uh, an example of Staples Instagram and also the Instagram from Smashfly, a little self-serving, I'm afraid. Um, so we find that Instagram is a great place for kind of casual career things. Things are a little bit more personal. Uh, and actually, the gentleman on the far right is named Rob Ward. He is a member of our marketing team. And uh, that is on National Coffee Day. That is actually our cold brew. We've got a cold brew, cold brew spout that people can go. So, no, Rob is drinking caffeine, not anything uh, a little harder than that. But uh, it's a great example of how you can get people a feel for your organization in a very appropriate channel. So you're matching your content to your particular channel. And this next one I think is really, really interesting. So here's a couple of examples. And one is, again, from Veritas. So Veritas does a nice job here uh, in a couple ways. They are taking segments about who they are and putting it into little discrete chunks so people can consume them and it's not too intimidating. So that is a great idea of a well-designed static piece of visual content. But who's really upping their game is Intel. Because Intel is actually doing a snapshot here of diversity. But it's not just a snapshot. It's actually interactive. So you can take a look at what Intel's doing and pick and choose the things that you want to see and actually play with the content. So it's visual, but it takes the next step to something that's going to keep people interacting with it, keep them longer interacting with your content, and make them remember it better because it's got that tactile feel. They've actually clicked on things, moved things around, and seeing how their, um, their actions have affected the content. And that makes it highly memorable. In a way, they're actually creating their own story as they click through uh, the information on Intel. So, you know, I'm, I think that what uh, Intel's doing here is really, really pretty amazing. Yeah, those are really great examples. Uh, the other thing I would mention about uh, visual content is I've also seen companies uh, make their values visual. Uh, which is a really great way to, if you hang them on the wall and when, uh, so that candidates see them clearly when they come in, uh, it's a really great way to sort of bring those visuals to life. Uh, and it's a great uh, talking point uh, when you're walking in with, uh, through your company. Uh, absolutely agree. We have that on in the office of our wall in Concord, as a matter of fact. Nice. Practicing what we preach. All right. So let's jump into job description here. Um, and the reason that I, I'm excited to talk about job descriptions, I've actually been writing a few um, lately myself, is because it get back, gets back to a story. Um, you want to make it clear, but 
what you're trying to do is evoke the idea of what it's like to work at your organization. So when I write a job description, I take it in a particular way. Um, I treat it like a journalist. And if anyone here has ever heard about journalism and what it takes when a journalist writes an article, who, how, where, when, and why. You want to make sure you cover that in any article you do. And I think it's important that you do that in a job description as well. So giving people a feel for uh, where they're working, who they're working with, what they're going to be doing, all of those different aspects, and doing it in a way that's the voice of your company. And there are a number of different ways uh, that you can do this based upon what the personality of your organization is. Are you very formal? Are you a large organization talking about that is touting your stability and your ability to uh, you know, be in business for 80 years? Are you a, a fairly active startup that has a, a bunch of people that are you know, a little bit more casual? Um, so do you open up with, you know, you will come into an organization that is, you know, the key to us is that we're here for the long term. Or are you starting it with, do you want to take over the world? And you have to decide what your voice is going to be. And then make sure you're covering all of those journalism points in that job description. So let's take a look at um, some examples here. Now, again, outside in. If we, so outside in, you want to make sure that if you are, if you're running a job description, that if you're focusing on the needs of the candidate, not yours. In fact, it's three times more effective if you focus on uh, the needs of the candidate. So here are some examples here. So I think Citizens Bank is uh, Tony. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what companies do with job descriptions. I think it's going to be the next uh, big form of content that uh, companies are going to be focusing on, uh, where you're going to start to see uh, companies like Citizen Bank really uh, adjusting their careers pages and trying to turn their careers pages into more of a description of what some of the work is like and really tell the story of what it's like to work those companies. I really love what you were saying, Rob, about making sure that the voice of your company is coming through in your job description. Uh, and I know that at Muse, we definitely use a structure of, uh, you know, what you'll love about us uh, and what we'll love about you to describe some of the qualifications. And that's very much so in line with our brand tone and the tone that's on Muse.com. So I love what you're saying there. And I think you're going to start seeing companies uh, play a little bit more with uh, the visuals of qualifications that you need. Uh, with sliding scales and uh, lots of visuals there, and also videos uh, embedded a little bit more as uh, links to describe the job uh, versus or along with text. So I'm really excited to see how companies uh, explore job descriptions as content. Uh, and I see you having a, an example here from Apple. Yeah, and I think um, it's interesting. When you think of Apple, you can think of kind of purity of design, how everything that they build seems to work well. And I think that they've taken that approach on their, on their job descriptions, too. They've kept them short, fairly terse. I think you know, it still it speaks to kind of their ability to say, say more and do more with less. So they've kept it kind of very, very quick so people can scan it quickly and find the job that's important for them. Yeah, I love that. And then we, yeah, and then we've got an example from Walmart, and it's a little different here because, I mean, you're looking for a pharmacy manager. And I think what they're doing is they are approaching it from the point of view is that, uh, again, keeping it kind of terse, but talking about some of the very hard specifics of the job, but keeping it uh, visually clean. And because that's one of the things that I, I see so many times in job descriptions when you go to different sites that they, they just get incredibly cluttered and hard to consume. So I think there's a design aspect that you have to keep in mind of saying, listen, how is this easy for me to read? Because it's, if it's going to be easy for you to read and clear, it's going to be easy for the consumer to read as well, and your applicant is going to get more out of it. So I think Walmart does a really nice job here with formatting in a way that uses a lot of great white space, makes it feel kind of light, and makes it feel easier to consume. So it's more of a, just a web page than a heavy job description. Yeah, that's a great example. So now we're going to talk about the wonderful world of email. And as a marketer, um, oh my goodness, I've been dealing with, e with email marketing since, oh, I, I'm not going to tell you how long, it's been a long time. Uh, so I've seen kind of the ebb and flow of email marketing. Um, and it, it comes down to thinking about both what's happening in the market when it comes to email and how you want to portray it. 
Um, because in, in the beginning, way back in the day, it was pure text and people just sent out emails and it looked like a letter that you wrote to your grandmother. Uh, and then people got very HTML focused and heavy and everything had to be formally laid out and, and looked like a marketing brochure when you got it. Um, and now I see things kind of flowing the other way. And I think the key to any email and any email marketing is to think of it in two different ways. One, the effectiveness of the piece that you're doing, so that means the voice, and your ability to tell a story, who's it coming from and who's it going to. So if you, again, are a smaller company that's trying to connect with people, you might want to be a little less formal. A straight text email from, from an individual sending it out is very, very acceptable. It doesn't have to be very, very formal. But I think the other part of it that's important is to realize that it's an ongoing conversation. So if you'd like to nurture your way into a relationship, you might want to think about the flow of emails. Maybe the first one is a, a simple text introduction. Maybe the second one is, a, is more, hey, I, I see you got that. I saw you clicked on the link. Here's another piece of content. So let me give you an example. Let's say someone looked at a, um, a job rec, and you did a follow-up, standard follow-up, that said, thank you for filling it out. We're reviewing your resume. Maybe the next thing you want to send them is something about, hey, do you know we've got a great flexible vacation policy? enables you to take your vacation whenever you want. Just thought you might find that easy. Next thing you might want to do is an infographic showing this is the way that, you know, this is our dress code. I got a great one from a company that said we're superheroes without dress codes. And it made me feel very special that I feel I could walk in there in a casual way when I wanted to and uh, I would be part of what their culture was. So don't think about a single email. Think of it as a paragraph in a story. And if you are going to be sending multiple emails, how you are building your story through the course of these emails. Yeah, I love that, Rob. I love the idea of sort of bringing candidates along and really nurturing them along the way using content. And, you know, as you all know, for those recruiters on the phone or on the webinar, uh, there are so many phases where you're trying to uh, bring candidates along with you. And content can be a really powerful partner for you. Uh, so first time outreach, emails. Uh, in those types of emails, you can include sort of a knock your socks off type of job description uh, that has the tone of your company, the story you're trying to tell. Uh, maybe it's uh, visual and really unique. Uh, candidates are really going to ask you for that anyway, so make it really stand out and be differentiated. Uh, more info through your careers page or any sort of third party vendors that are going to help you bring your, your company culture to life in a really authentic way including links to those are really great selling points as you're first reaching out to candidates and they're still getting to know uh, you and your company. And then there's the uh, keeping you warm, uh, sort of still courting candidates type of emails. And in those emails, uh, content can really still be a really powerful partner to you, um, including things like company press, a quote from one of your leaders uh, when they just spoke at a conference, or better yet, a link. Uh, a newsletter of some sort uh, that your company creates to different talent communities. Uh, some of those things that those types of content can be really powerful in the sort of keeping you warm phase. Uh, then there's also the what to expect in the interview process. So once someone's booked and they're in it, they're going to interview with you. Uh, I love Rob's idea of an infographic, uh, sending them an infographic of the process. Uh, we all know our processes are getting longer and longer nowadays with now uh, skills workshops and rounds and rounds and rounds. So really being able to uh, succinctly tell uh, people what to expect in an infographic is a really great piece of content. Uh, and better yet, uh, a video at this point uh, explaining the process. It could even be a step further. And then there's the, you know, we really want to hire you type of email. Um, and in this process, a great quote from the manager that they're likely going to be working with or uh, a link to any of the stories from the team that they're going to be working with that you captured through any sort of tool, whether it's old school or tools like Grant Builder. Like those types of things are really powerful in that stage. Uh, and then content can also be a really great partner to you still during the you sign phase when you don't want to just say, okay, you've signed letter and, and that's it. Uh, you want to still engage them and make them feel good about what they just did and pictures of the team. Uh, articles and advice on their first 90 days can be really powerful pieces of content in that phase. And if you're going to do pictures of the team, I think it's a good idea to set up like a regular photo shoot with teams so you have those fresh and it's uh, recent numbers. 
Uh, and then I also think, you know, at, at the Muse, our founders actually send uh, personal notes uh, and sometimes links to any of the stuff they've done after people sign. So that can also be a really great way to engage via email. Absolutely agree. So here's a couple of great examples. So uh, Great Clips, they do an automated email to remind candidates who started filling out a profile to complete it. Uh, it really gave their pipeline an extra boost because they found 74% of the candidates would drop off at some point during the application process. Uh, and then you look at another great example from Fiserv here. Uh, they actually send those type of nurture emails. So they talk about the company culture and uh, the employees, and they, also have, they always have a call to action at the end, trying to drive people on to that next step. So here you've got one email, multiple pieces of content, and a call to action. So it's kind of like getting a, an interesting newsletter to help connect people with the organization and keep them warm. And that could be whether they are an applicant or maybe they're a silver medalist and you just want to keep in contact with them. So it's important that you think about communicating with all the people that potentially could join your organization once you have that relationship with them. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I want to move into just a few tips from our Muse editors uh, who are content creation experts and uh, they gave me a little bit of advice so, so I'm going to share it with you. The first thing they said is uh, research what your competitors are doing and try to differentiate your content. So your competitors are talking a lot in their content, your, their first page about development opportunities. You want to match that, you want to talk about your development opportunities but maybe you want to talk about that plus uh, showcase some of the really great talent you have at the companies at your company uh, that candidates can really learn from uh, or something else unique about your company through your content. Uh, the next is to create a company hashtag employees can use when posting uh, either at an event uh, or another area where you're capturing photos so everything's compiled in one place. And the next is to consider a contest or giveaway to get people involved in sharing stories uh, and participating in video. Uh, so after you collect some of these employee stories, uh, perhaps offering an award or having a contest for the best story uh, or team video created, anything to make this a little bit more fun for employees as they help you essentially create content that's going to help you uh, in your candidate experience process. Uh, the other uh, two tips that our editors gave is uh, to make it as easy as possible for people to contribute stories and photos. Uh, and so instead of just asking people, do you have any uh, stories to share, actually creating sort of a Mad Libs type of uh, form for them so they can, as they're filling it out, it's actually building a story for them that's uh, pretty entertaining. Uh, so that's, that's one idea. And uh, the final tip they shared is actually to create a photo library. It, it's something that uh, we have at the Muse as well, but it's a, it's a central repository where all you have all your testimonials and photos and it's really so that it's at the fingertips of your recruiters and they can pull the appropriate content in at the time that they really need it uh, to make that candidate experience fantastic. So um, I know we talked a little bit on this before Rob but do you have any final words on uh, ways that we can partner with marketing? Uh, I actually love your idea earlier really bringing them along uh, in the process and, and journey to solve a common problem, but is there, do you have any uh, final words or tips on, on this before we move on? Yeah, I think the, the key is that a, a lot of people think, well, you know, if I'm walking in and I am a talent acquisition professional, I am asking for marketing to do something they don't want to do because, you know, it's not going to bring in leads and it's not going to sell product. And uh, any good marketer is not just pitching product or services. They're pitching the entire corporate brand. You should walk in there very proudly saying, what I bring to the table represents that corporate brand and will help really drive brand awareness and tell our brand story. So you're bringing in, you're bringing assets. So you don't walk in with your, your hat in your hand. Walk in proudly saying, I can help you. And, and then you can help me a little bit too. So I think that is probably one of the, the most important thing to think about is that it's a partnership and you are bringing value to the table to the market. Yeah, that's great advice. So as so, we wrap up, Yeah, go ahead, go ahead Tony. Uh, so um, as we wrap up, uh, wanted to leave you with a few key takeaways. And the first is really to start small. Um, and Rob, do you want to talk a little bit more about, about this slide? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. So I, Tony's absolutely right in starting small. Don't be afraid. Don't try to do it all at one time. In fact, we gave you six pieces of content. Pick one. You know, pick one, maybe pick two, play with it. And start figuring out, it's like, okay, I can, I can take this, whether it's a visual or maybe starting out in video, and just figure out how I can get some quick wins, and you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, always remember to tell a story. You are storytellers. You're telling the story of your employees. You're telling the story of your company. And people are going to remember you more. If you remember Kitty Lawler, my grandmother that was working in my building in 1905, I'm betting you kind of remember, you probably have a picture of my office in your head. That's because I told you a little story about it. And it, it really helps people focus and remember the message that we brought. Um, then create your path. Remember, content is, st they're stepping stones. They're chapters in a book. They are lines in a story. They are leading from the individual to you. Write them that way and figure out how people are going to consume them and how they want to consume them most importantly. And finally, invest in those cross-functional relationships because even though you're going to be getting better and better at telling your stories, sometimes it's nice to have a designer in your back pocket or an editor or someone who can help you figure out the intricacies of, of your email uh, platform. So there are people out there. Just make sure you walk in. They, they probably want to help you more than you think. So it's important to really start in those easy ways and they'll get you some quick wins. That's great. Well, I certainly will not forget the story of your grandma that's already working. <laughs> she would be so proud. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, that was a lot of great content and actionable takeaways. Uh, we do have a lot of good questions. So we have about six minutes left, so we'll get to as many questions as we can. Just a reminder for everyone, we will be sending out a recording and slides today, so you will get those in your inbox. Um, so, Robert, this first question is for you. Would you make a persona per role or per department? Oh, definitely per role. Uh, per department is not going to get you the level of specificity you need. Uh, I would make it per role, and uh, I would also think about how you could cut that persona uh, if you need to do it by based on seniority, because you could have different stories based upon where people are in their careers. Great. Uh, Tony, we have a question from someone. Do you have to get employee permission in writing? It's always a really good idea to get employee permission in writing. I have had situations where I haven't gotten the photo waiver ahead of time, and the employee was fine with it. Uh, most employees don't really have an issue with it, but it's always better to be safe because I have actually had also a couple, of experience, a couple of experiences where employees did have a problem with <laughs> being featured, so you just never know and it's always better to be safe. Great. Um, again, if you want to pop in any more questions, go ahead and shoot that in the question box. Um, this next one that we have, when creating a company hashtag, and I think both of you can probably answer this in some capacity, how do you ensure that the photos and videos others are posting are on brand and not questionable? Um, Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, that tends to be a training question to, from my yeah. point of view. It's all about making sure people understand the guidelines and what's appropriate um, because w with great power comes great responsibility and when you give people the ability to post things, you got to make sure they understand what is appropriate. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, definitely, uh, as you start to do more of this, um, holding in a sort of official training or sending out an official message about what it means to be on brand is a really great way to set that up. Great, thank you. Um, what is the best social strategy for developing a brand, for developing brand awareness for a startup in a medium-sized company? So a startup in a medium-sized company. Or sorry, start a, I read that wrong. Start a two medium-sized company. Um, I would say from a social point of view, I would start the easy path, the, the ones that are most easily accessible. It depends on what you're, what you're trying to get out there uh, and where the watering holes are for the people that you want. So I always recommend uh, you know, tw 
Twitter, LinkedIn, all the standards are probably the ones that I would definitely start with. Uh, and then if you have, if you're trying to target particular people, you find their watering holes. So whether if you're trying to do a particular, you know, engineer, new hire engineers, you go to MIT or, you know, Stanford or, or someplace like that, and you try to find the social media hangouts for those type of people. So it all comes down to targeting your personas, figuring out where they are, and then addressing them per the social channels that they, they would consume. Great. Thank you. Tony, do you have any advice for companies or agencies who work with classified material? Any tips for their blogs or videos? Yeah, that, that can be a little bit uh, tricky, but I do think, uh, first, I think collect all the ideas that you want to do and also the types of candidates that you're maybe trying to attract um, and thinking about the story you want to tell and the channels that will be most powerful and the content that might be, be most powerful. Uh, and then actually meet, I would meet with your legal team uh, to run them through all those ideas and see what you can and can't do uh, and get very clear once you have a really robust list uh, because you might be able to do a little bit more than you think you can. Great. Uh, so we'll do two more questions here. Uh, Rob, what is the best place to start a blog? Facebook, LinkedIn, anywhere else? The best way to start a blog? Um, Basically, I would say it, it doesn't matter where you start it, it, it matters where you promote it. So it can live anywhere. You can put it on any of the standard you know, WordPress style blog, uh, blogging platforms, but then promote it. So anytime you write a blog, say, I'm always going to promote it on LinkedIn, I'm always going to promote it on Twitter at a minimum, and then uh, try to promote it as well. You can, you can, it's amazing how quickly you can go from having three people read your blog to have 15 or 1,800 read your blog. So just make sure you cross-promote. Great. Thank you. I actually think uh, we are about running out of time here, and I don't want to keep anyone over the limit and by answering another question. But we will we'll try to get some of these if we can answer them after, and we will be sending out the materials today. Again, thank you, Tony and Robert, for sharing your time with us and insight. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be My here. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye.